articles. In 2080, he was honored with the Research to Prevent Blindness Award for outstanding age-related macular degeneration research. And during his scientific career, Dr. Mullins contributes to a better understanding of structural uh, and molecular basis for degenerative disease of the retina, with particular focus on the best disease and age-related macular degeneration. And his recent studies are particularly focused on characterization of the biological changes or of choriocapillaries in human eyes with macular degeneration and on molecular responses of human choroidal endothelial cells to microenvironmental pre-inflammatory uh, challenges that occur in macular degeneration, including exposure to component com uh, complement components and products of extracellular matrix protein uh, degradation. And without any further ado, I warmly invite you to follow Dr. Robert Mullins' lecture, with entitled, which is entitled The Choriocapillaries in Age-Related Macular Degeneration, Avoiding an Existential Lysis. And thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for that uh, kind introduction. And it's a delight to get to uh, share some of our work today. Uh, you know, one of the great things about being able to do this kind of presentation by Zoom is that uh, if there's a, a, a question that I don't like or that's too difficult during the question bit, I can just kind of. <laughs> and oh, uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, the, the the video feed was broken because somebody else asked a different question. Now, um, so uh, so anyway, uh, what are the great Zoom advantages of our day? Um, so thanks so much for the invitation to come and speak. Uh, I've been a great admirer of. Uh, of so many of the researchers at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute and the, the great work that you guys are doing. And so uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present. I uh, have no uh, financial disclosures associated uh, with any of this work that I'm gonna be uh, talking about today. So the disease that I'd like to uh, talk about is age-related macular degeneration or AMD. And it's a very common disease, affects as many as a third of uh, individuals over the age of uh, 65. Uh, it's complex, in, meaning that there's an intersection of genetics and environmental exposures and age acting uh, on the aging eye and leading to uh, ultimately the degenerative process. And so the risk of getting macular degeneration is determined by some combination of genes and environmental cues uh, all over the course of the, the aging life. Characteristic deposits form in AMD called drusen, and these can be either beneath the retinal pigment epithelium or above the, uh, above the RPE. And while most people with early, on, or early stage macular degeneration do not progress to real vision threatening uh, consequences, uh, many do. And so maybe uh, 10 to 15% of individuals will get a neovascular. AMD event and a, a similar number will get uh, advanced atrophy. So there are a number of ways that one could go about studying a disease like AMD, and uh, these include cell culture systems, animal models, uh, living patients, as well as donor tissue. And the work I'm going to be talking to you about today will touch on all of these, but particularly in the human donor eye area. So since about 2014, we've been in a, or sorry, 2004, we've had a large push at University of Iowa to collect donor eyes. And this has been through a partnership with the Iowa Lions Eye Bank, which is part of our department, which is really uh, convenient and, and a, positive, uh, a positive thing. Since that time, we've collected over 3,000 eyes. We have people on call round the clock, uh, going out and retrieving the tissue, bringing it back to the lab so that we can get the samples preserved in as short a period of time as possible after death, since, as you know, uh, macromolecules degrade as a function of, uh, of, of time. Um, we, this collection includes both samples from grateful patients with rare diseases like retinitis pigmentosa, best disease, uh, as well as very common diseases like glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy and AMD. And from each of these eyes, we collect samples that we can isolate DNA from and, and uh, study the impact of genetic variants on the anatomical and biochemical changes that happen in the donor eyes. And in many cases, we also are able to get a pretty extensive clinical history. Uh, you know, people in Iowa often will be pretty stationary. And uh, we may have the same, we may have uh, four decades of clinical records 
on the same patient who uh, is who receives care in our clinics. So I just want to show a few examples of both the fungus clinical image on the left and histological image on the right of what some of these structures look like that I'm going to be talking to you about. And so uh, on the left here is a, a normal eye with the uh, uh, optic nerve, the uh, visceral region uh, bounded by the arcade blood vessels is called the macula and the fovea is in the center. And you can see the intact three layers of the, uh, the retina, the three nuclear layers, as well as the inner segments and outer segments. In early AMD, we see the accumulation of these deposits called drusen that form, uh, we, we used to say, always beneath the RPE. Now from the work of Christine Curcio and Rick Spade and others, we know that there are also these common uh, subretinal drusenoid deposits. Uh, but this is what some of the sub-RPE ones look like. And you can see that they can get large and can actually displace photoreceptor cells. Uh, but if all you ever have is drusen, th these are not large vision-threatening complications of AMD. But what can happen is many patients with drusen will go on and get uh, additional end stages of AMD like uh, neovascular uh, AMD or uh, macular neovascularization as it's currently called, where now instead of having intact photoreceptor cells and uh, uh, inner and outer segments, we, we see these tubulations that will often form, uh, subretinal fibrosis, this collagen-rich uh, material here. The RPE can also uh, often survive here, um, but there's, uh, it's clearly you know, vision-threatening, uh, vision-destroying phenomenon when it gets to this stage. And in addition to neovascular AMD, which there are uh, effective treatments for many patients, there's also atrophic AMD, uh, geographic atrophy, where the photoreceptors in RPE and choriocapillaris all undergo degeneration and, uh, and, and are completely uh, lost, as you see here. So uh, again, I just want to show an example of a normal eye. And you can see all these layers, ganglion cell layer, inner nuclear layer, outer nuclear layer. See the inner segments uh, lined up here, the outer segments, the RPE, the choriocapillaris, and the deeper choroid. And if we look at an eye with end stage atrophic AMD, we see that there's still a ganglion cell layer, there's still inner nuclear layer. And you know, the persistence of these layers is important as we imagine therapeutic restoration using stem cells. But the photoreceptors, the RPE, and the choriocapillaris are all uh, completely uh, annihilated, they're gone. And so one of the questions that we've been very interested in in the lab and studying over the years is what order do these cell types degenerate? Because ideally, we would step in as early as possible and put the brakes on degeneration and not wait until uh, you know, the, the forest fire has already uh, burned down the forest, but, but stop it as early as possible. Um, you know, a couple of other areas to consider with this question, is AMD really one disease? And, and you know, we know that there are different genetic factors. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and, and so the answer is probably not, you know, that there are probably multiple pathways that can put one on this uh, degenerative um, program. One aspect of AMD, and the one I'm going to be talking about today, is that there's aberrant complement genetics and pathophysiology. And so in, in those cases of AMD, what order do the cells undergo degeneration? So we studied this using a, a morphometric experiment. We collected a series of human eyes. We uh, did histology on these, and we labeled the sections with a lectin called UEA1. And uh, I'll, I'll show you a lot of examples of this during the course of the talk. Uh, but it's uh, the, the value of this lectin is it'll show viable endothelial cells compared to uh, regions of the eye that might look like there's an endothelial cell, but there's really nothing there. Uh, so we labeled sections with UEA1, and we measured uh, the, the abundance of drusen, the height of the RPE, the, how many intact and ghost uh, vessels there are. I'll tell you about this in a second. And we collected all of these data masked to the, the donor identity, uh, genotype, clinical diagnosis, any of that kind of information uh, was, was not used in the collection. So we, we collect all this mask to affection status. And when we unmasked the, the samples, oh, I actually show you an example of what this looks like first. So uh, here's an a immunofluorescence image of uh, of uh, RPE and choroid. You see the RPE here, this, this uh, autofluorescence is very normal uh, in the RPE. Um, and we've labeled with this lectin UEA1, which labels intact blood vessels. So you see these 
these red circles cut in cross section, these are the, the capillaries, the chordae capillaris. And you can also see that there are some unlabeled tubes that are uh, they're unreactive with UEA1. So these are regions that probably used to harbor a capillary, and now there's no longer a capillary there. And so we quantified the healthy chordae capillaris areas. We quantified the number of ghost vessels that you would count. We uh, quantified the cross-sectional area of drusen, the height of the RPE, and then we normalized all of these measurements to the length of Brooks membrane over which we could collect the uh, over which we could collect the measurements. Because if there was a bigger punch or a smaller punch still centered on the macula, we didn't want to uh, trick ourselves into uh, you know being confused about that. So everything's normalized to length. And what we found is that uh, on the x-axis here is the uh, a measure of the Drusen cross-sectional area, where uh, going from left to right, Drusen are increasing. And what we found is that if we look at the chordiocapillaris density of intact chordiocapillaris, this decreases as you have more Drusen. So there's, uh, and, and there's a chicken egg question that we can talk about in a bit. But in any case, there's an association between loss of capillary blood vessels and these pathologic deposits that form underneath the RPE. When we looked at the RPE, we did not see a similar association. So this dropout is a chordiocapillaris dropout and not an RPE dropout. Now, I say dropout, do we know that that's really what it is? Because, uh, you know, you can imagine that eyes that always just had a lower vascular density are eyes that tend to get more drusen, and eyes that have a higher vascular density are eyes that tend to get fewer drusen. And so this is why we were very interested in this question of the ghost vessels. And if we quantify ghost vessels and look at those versus drusen density, we find again, uh, as drusen increase, there's an increase in the number of bad uh, blood vessels, ghost blood vessels, so unoccupied capillary lumens. Um, well, one other feature that was that was interesting and, and a little harder to quantify was we noticed that drusen tend to be present where there are blood vessels missing. So uh, this hard druse here over this ghost capillary, this little druse here over this ghost capillary. And when we went to quantify that, what we did was we measured the vascular density beneath drusen compared to the vascular density between drusen in the same section. And what we found is that there's a significant uh, decrease of blood vessels beneath drusen compared to between drusen. And uh, Emery Lignol described a similar phenomenon uh, in terms of an association of drusen with intercapillary pillars, these structures between capillaries. We're now seeing it in eyes that have a loss of capillaries. So what do we know about chordiocapillaris? Um, so this is a very dense vascular bed, and maybe denser than any vascular bed in the body. This UEA stained full mount uh, here, you can see the little dark spots in there. Those are the spots where there's not a blood vessel. All of the red is where there's capillary endothelial cells. And so it's this dense meshwork of, uh, of capillaries, very high flow. The capillaries themselves are high uh, they're, they're fenestrated like those in the kidney, although there, there are some differences, and they're very large caliber. So, you know, the, the, the typical capillary that we learn about in physiology where one red blood cell can squeeze through at a time, uh, this is not the way it is in chordae capillaris. These are actually really large bore vessels. Chordae capillaris is responsible for supplying the photoreceptor cells and the RPE. So, while the retina does have its own vascular supply, that vascular supply is only sufficient for the, the inner retina and the, the outer retina and the RPE require this, uh, this large source from the chordae capillaris. It has its own set of genes that are expressed uh, locally compared to other kinds of endothelial cells, both in the eye and, uh, and, uh, and, and other non-capillary cells of the choroid. And, uh, and as I mentioned, it supplies the outer retina and it removes waste, it removes heat, uh, it removes probably other uh, pathologic accumulations that, uh, that happen during aging. So everything I've told you so far is about early AMD. And we mostly were interested in this because um, 
you know, again, we, we, we want to know what the earliest steps are and where one might intervene uh, to most effect. At the same time, we're also, uh, you, you know, as we, we started talking to more clinicians, um, they, they suggested, well, why don't you care about these advanced stages and everything? And so, well, everything burns down as advanced. And I say, well, if you look before it's too advanced, it's good. So uh, we did this experiment where we looked at a separate cohort of 143 donors uh, with either age match controls, early AMD, or geographic atrophy. And we collected the capillary measurements for geographic atrophy outside of the area of RPE degeneration. And so here's what we found. And so this, instead of using the Drusen density as the uh, as criterion, this is just using you know categories. And so the changes look a little less uh, dramatic. Um, but comparing early AMDIs to controls that are old enough to have AMD but do not, we see a significant decrease in capillary density. And that's similar to what I've been telling you about in the first study. But if we look at geographic atrophy, there's a profound loss of chorea capillaris. And uh, this is, again, outside of the area where there's loss of RPE. So, uh, you know, as you know, there's, there's this interrelationship between RPE and chorea capillaris and photoreceptors. And if there's loss of any one layer, the others will also undergo uh, injury. This has been shown certainly in animals with um, a sodium iodate injury model where you can destroy the RPE and then you see subsequent dropout of chorea capillaris. But here's loss of chorea capillaris underneath an intact RPE. And uh, I just wanted to show you a, a histological example of this. Uh, here's control eye. You can see this very robust, dense capillary lumens uh, underneath the RPE here. And a GAI outside of the area of RPE atrophy with these large um, uh, areas of depleted chorea capillaris. This loss has been unappreciated historically. And, and part of the reason is on H&E stain, or if you're not using a specific way to label viable endothelial cells, it's, it's difficult to tell what's a normal endothelial cell or what's a normal capillary from one that's a formerly occupied capillary that's, uh, that doesn't have living uh, lining and doesn't have flow through it. So if I show an image like this, and I asked how many capillaries you see in cross-section, I think most of us would say uh, about four, right? It, within the box, one, two, three, four. If we use UEA to detect only the viable ones, though, there's actually only a single capillary in this zone, and the, the rest of these are all ghost vessels. And it's actually even a little extra tricky because you, you look at this one and say, well, wait a minute, Mullins, there's blood cells going through that capillary. That's a, that's an, that's a viable capillary. Well, those aren't red blood cells. These are uh, some cells that migrate into the spaces. We see this all the time. And um, we, we don't know what, what they are exactly uh, or, or why, they, uh, why they like those areas, but ghost vessels will be filled with some kind of choroidal uh, macrophage or other, um, other resident cell type. Um, and then eventually these will fill in with, with sort of a sediment of collagen and will become lost. But, uh, we, we see preservation of these structures for uh, quite a while. And then ultrastructurally, they're a little easier to tell than on H&E. Uh, here's a, a section through a, a normal Cori capillaris capillary. And then here's a ghost vessel. And you can see a little bit this extracellular matrix material surrounding it. And this is why on lower resolution approaches, people have missed these uh, vessels. So uh, I told you that we see loss of chorea capillaris in macular degeneration, uh, that there's loss in association with drusen, there's loss in association with GA, and uh, are there consequences to this loss? And why does this matter so much if it's such a highly overperfused uh, blood vessel bed? And uh, I just want to tell you for a minute about some uh, fantastic experiments done by uh, Rob Linsenmeyer at Northwestern. And, um, so, you know, in, in, in basic science departments, usually the photoreceptors are, are, are outer segment up. And in clinical uh, papers and conferences, the photoreceptors are always pointing down. And so for this image, I'm uh, splitting the difference and rotating at 90 degrees because it goes with the graph I'm going to show you. But uh, if, if, you, if you have a retina like this where the, the choroid is on one side, the vitreous is on the other side, uh, here's the distance that one photoreceptor cell occupies and okay, one cone. Um, so 
Lindsay Meyer and colleagues did this experiment in uh, cats and in rats where they, they put a probe, an oxygen probe through the retina and started recording the partial pressure of oxygen. And then they withdrew the probe out of the retina and at every, uh, at every distance along this vector, they recorded the partial pressure of oxygen. And so we can say, what's the oxygen partial pressure in the internuclear layer, what it is in the ONL, what is it in the choroid. And when they uh, did these experiments, this is a, a, a sort of crudely redrawn graph by me. Um, what they found is that there's this profound plunge of oxygen as you move from the RPE down uh, through the inner segment to the outer nuclear layer. And so along the length of one photoreceptor cell, essentially all of the oxygen from the choroid is used up. And even within the photoreceptor cell, the partial pressure of the oxygen in the dark is about zero. And so even though the choroid is this very profoundly dense blood vessel bed with high flow and high oxygen delivery to the retina, all of that retinal, uh, all of that oxygen is being consumed uh, in the retina. And then on the other side, toward the, the ganglion cell layer and the, toward the vitreous, there's this other, uh, the spike or this hump, this is due to the retinal circulation. So the retinal circulation supplies the relatively non-consumptive inner retinal neurons, uh, but the choroidal circulation is what's necessary to provide for the uh, photoreceptors. And so, you know, a, a 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 percent, uh, as we see, drop off in the vascularity of the choroid could have profound impact on the uh, on the photoreceptors' uh, oxygen needs. And you know, one other comment about RPE, um, RPE may undergo changes that are very important in uh, macular degeneration, and, and undoubtedly it does. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been the main focus of our field uh, for the last uh, 30 years or more. Um, but in terms of survival, RPE is very good at surviving in pretty uh, unfavorable circumstances. And so you can see here, on the left, on top of an old uh, area of choroidal fibrosis, um, the RPE is still able to survive as a monolayer. It doesn't require photoreceptors. It doesn't require uh, much corticopolaris. Um, it's, it's very good at, um, at living in these sort of adverse conditions. So we, we see corticopolaris loss early in AMD. And uh, you know, the next question we really want to talk about is what's the mechanism of this loss? And a lot of our understanding of, uh, of this area has been informed by genetics. And there was this real ground changing uh, set of papers that came out in 2005, in which multiple groups independently described a single polymorphism in a gene that was highly associated with, uh, with AMD. And in fact, uh, being homozygous for this uh, gene was found to be associated with four to seven times higher uh, prevalence of AMD. Uh, heterozygosity for this polymorphism was two to four times higher than people who were homozygous for the, uh, the, the, the major allele. And so this, this one uh, amino acid, and these things all exist really in haplotypes and everything. Uh, this one amino acid though is really, was sort of a perfect storm for the field. And everybody thought that this was going to revolutionize all of medicine and all of biology and, and really, um, you know, in other fields outside of AMD. And, uh, you know, really in AMD, this has had the, the largest impact. Um, but, you know, using the human genome uh, sequence with a set of 100 cases and 100 controls, one could discover this variant uh, with genome-wide significance, like 10 to the minus 5 uh, p-value. So it, it's about twice as abundant in AMD patients as it is in control patients. It has a relatively high minor allele frequency uh, and this large effect size. So there's, there's this sort of perfect storm of events surrounding this particular polymorphism uh, that you know, helped it be discovered and helped shape our uh, thinking about how this contributes to macular degeneration. So if you remember the complement system, uh, it's this, this, this complicated series of uh, circulating proteases and 
uh, interacting proteins and activating and inhibiting proteins. Um, and I'm not gonna spend uh, very much time on these at all, except to say that uh, complement factor H is a protein that inhibits uh, the C3B-BB uh, convertase. Uh, it does some other things as well. It binds C-reactive protein, it binds extracellular matrix. Um, and for these complement proteins no or pathways, no matter how they're activated, they'll all converge on uh, forming the membrane attack complex if they're not uh, suppressed. And complement factor H is, a, uh, again, an inhibitor of uh, one of these pathways, major fluid phase inhibitor. And after the discovery of polymorphisms in complement factor H, multiple other polymorphisms were discovered in other, uh, in other genes that are involved in the same pathway. Um, and so, you know, where, where factor H was kind of the, uh, the, the entry into this area, there are numerous uh, genes and polymorphisms uh, associated. Again, if, if left unsuppressed, uh, the natural role of the complement system will result in the formation of this uh, membrane attack complex. And this is sort of what it looks like from um, uh, atomic force microscopy where there's a, a C5B and a C6, a C7, a C8, and then a series of C9 molecules that will penetrate a cell and form a, a pore that will do things like let calcium in and let uh, uh, water out. And a cell that has one of these membrane attack complexes inserted in its uh, membrane can probably have mechanisms for defeating that and, and either externalizing or internalizing that bit of membrane. If there are multiple events, there's some tipping point at which it will result in, uh, in, in lysis of the cell. And so even though the reason that we have the complement system isn't to do bystander injury to ourselves, polymorphisms that loosen up the regulation uh, may lead to more self-injury and um, uh, you know, bystander damage of these complexes. Now, fortunately, there are antibodies that uh, will recognize specifically the activated forms of complement. And so we took some of these antibodies and applied them to human eye sections to determine and learn uh, what complement is doing, what the MAC is doing in the aging eye. And so uh, what we learned is that the MAC is specific to chorea capillaris uh, compared to other regions of the eye. And so uh, here's, a, here's a retina labeled with DAPI. You can see the nuclear layers. You can see the retinal blood vessels, uh, the RPE. And then this green fluorescence is due to the MAC complex. And it's localized to exactly the same region, the same cells that I just uh, have been telling you are the first cells to undergo degeneration in AMD. Um, you know, one thing we worried about with this finding is well, what if this is just sort of a, a thing that happens in all blood vessel beds after death and it's, it, there's no specificity of it to the choroid or to the eye. And so uh, we, we did some experiments where we looked at multi-tissue arrays, uh, both paraffin and frozen sections to see if this is just a generalizable finding or if it really has something specific to do to the eye or to macular degeneration. And what we found from these experiments is that really, although you do see some matterings of the MAC in other uh, tissues, nowhere like the chorea capillaris do you see deposition of, uh, of this complex. Uh, we looked at this process in aging eyes and found that in newborns, we, we don't see uh, much, much MAC, but as early as 14 months, it begins to be deposited uh, in Brooks membrane, uh, more in five years and more at 41 years. And so this challenge at the level of the choroid is something that, uh, that we're facing sort of for our, our entire lifetime. Uh, raising question, is it doing something good in some cases or uh, you know, why is it there? But, but it's there pretty early. Um, but it's not there equally in, in everybody. And so we did some ELISA experiments in which we uh, obtained human eyes, uh, isolated protein, and looked at a series of young eyes, uh, choroids, a series of old choroids, and we saw that there's a, 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 about a doubling of the abundance of MAC during normal aging, going from under 40 to uh, over 80. 
Um, and then hopefully you can see this. My Zoom has all the little uh, pictures of us on the right-hand side. Um, that in eyes with macular degeneration, we saw about twice as high MAC concentration as we see in, um, in normal aging. So uh, th this is a, a feature of, uh, of normal aging, but it's also uh, much more abundant in eyes with AMD. Um, so how about factor H genotype? And so these are experiments that were done by uh, Katie Churko, who was a doctoral student in my lab for a few years and is now a scientist at uh, OHSU. And um, looking at genotype to RPE choroid tissue, uh, we, we collected RPE choroid tissue, we collected serum from the same individuals. And what we found is that the abundance of MAC is significantly higher in patients that, have, that are homozygous for the high risk factor H genotype compared to low risk in the choroid. But if we look in serum, we see no difference between uh, high risk and low risk serum. So there's something specific about this polymorphism and its action in the choroid that we both see more MAC in choroid than other organs. And uh, also there's an effect that's happening right here where we see the vascular loss. Um, so, so MAC is present at the scene of the crime. Uh, it, it increases in eyes that have disease and have vascular loss. Does it do anything to endothelial cells? And uh, so we did a series of experiments in which we grew endothelial cells, incubated them with, uh, with either complement deficient serum or complement intact serum. And we see that there is indeed um, activation on some endothelial cells. And if we quantify loss using lactate dehydrogenase assay of cells that have been exposed to either uh, just medium in blue or complement deficient medium in yellow or complement intact medium in red, we see a time uh, course dependent uh, cell loss of cells that are exposed to, uh, to complement. So the MAC is capable of, of lysing endothelial cells in vitro. Well, so we see increase in MAC in eyes with AMD and with high genetic risk for AMD. We see it around the same cells that die first in AMD. And we see that uh, we have evidence that it's capable of killing endothelial cells uh, in vitro. So is there anything we can do about this? You know, can we ameliorate the impact of uh, MAC activation? And um, so again, here's, here's complement vector H and its participation in uh, inhibition of uh, of, of complement activation. And I, I want to call attention to this, uh, this terrific paper that's a little uh, underappreciated in my view um, from uh, Ophthalmology 2013 by uh, Andrew Lodery's group in which, um, so, you know, so, so complement proteins are uh, largely synthesized in liver as are, uh, you know, many and most circulating proteins. Uh, and as I'll tell you in a minute, these, these, these proteins can also be synthesized in the eye. And so what, uh, what this group did was they, they identified a couple of hundred patients who had had liver transplant. And among those patients who had had liver transplant, they looked and, and saw if they had macular degeneration or not. And there was a requirement that the, the transplant had to be at least five years out from when they, uh, when they did the investigation. And the, the patients that they focused on were those who had had a liver transplant where the liver that they received had a discordant complement factor H genotype compared to the recipient, right? So if you were homozygous for tyrosine and you got a homozygous uh, tyrosine liver, then, then the impact of liver versus uh, uh, otherwise uh, factor H wouldn't be that, that valuable to understand. But if you were a high-risk person who received a low-risk liver, or you were a low-risk person who received a high-risk liver, these discordant transplants could tell you about the relative importance of, uh, of liver-derived versus otherwise-derived complement factor H. And what they found is that uh, the, the, the genotype of the, of the individual, of the recipient, was much more important and, and was important uh, for their risk of getting macular degeneration, whereas the genotype of the the donor's complement factor H was not, uh, was not important. 
And so circulating factor H uh, doesn't seem to be sufficient to drive this pathology. If we look at factor H uh, expression of the RNA, um, we, we did this experiment where we collected some, uh, some eye punches, we scraped off the RPE, we isolated RNA from that RPE, we peeled the choroid off of the sclera, isolated RNA from, uh, from the, the choroid, and uh, did quantitative PCR for uh, factor H. And we found that the choroid makes much, much more factor H uh, RNA than RPE does. And I don't know if you can see this orange bar or not on the right-hand side there, but uh, the, the level per microgram of complement factor H RNA in choroid is comparable to what the liver makes. Now we have a lot more micrograms of liver than we do of choroid, but nevertheless, in that local space, uh, there's, there's, com there's comparable uh, synthesis. And um, this next slide is probably only interesting to me, but you know, there's, a, there's another isoform of factor H, uh, a CFH called uh, FHL1. And um, this is expressed at much lower levels in both the RPE and choroid compared to the, uh, the full length, uh, the full length isoform. When we did our single cell RNA sequencing experiments, we also could uh, a little bit more definitively assign expression levels to different cell types. Um, and what we found is that there's high expression of the CFH RNA in endothelial cells, pericytes, and fibroblasts, uh, which was higher than the expression in the RPE. There's also some expression in um, retinal endothelial cells. And um, so this was published in, uh, by, by Drew Voigt in um, Human Molecular Genetics. And I just, I always want to sort of advertise our uh, single cell website here for anybody who's interested in gene expression in the eye. Um, if you go log on to this website and type in your favorite gene, you can see what cells uh, express it. So there's high expression of factor H in the choroid. And there's evidence based on the liver transplant data that that local expression is maybe more important than the expression in the liver or the, or the circulating uh, factor H. And so we, we started doing some experiments to modulate local expression of factor H in order to see if we can uh, ameliorate complement injury. And these are experiments done by our uh, uh, scientist, Kelly Mulfall. Uh, so in these experiments, we, we first tried knocking down locally expressed factor H. And this was done using um, a, a cultured choroidal endothelial cell line and mortal cell line uh, that we used for these experiments. And we can effectively knock down, or Kelly can, effectively knock down expression of complement factor H using siRNA uh, for, uh, for a few days uh, in culture. So does knocking down that local expression do anything to the ability of the cell to defend itself against the MAC? And so, um, so again, here's the, the, the relative levels of, uh, of complement factor H with the siRNA compared to uh, scrambled RNA. And if we label with the anti-MAC antibody uh, after uh, exposing cells to complement intact serum, what we see is in this case, in normal cells, we saw relatively low uh, labeling with MAC. There are a few cells. But if we suppress complement factor H locally synthesized, we see increase in MAC. Now, you know, anytime you show somebody a fluorescent image, uh, it, it's possible that, that, you know, I just put the microscope where I wanted to. And so, um, you know, we always try to quantify uh, these things. And it, it, when we quantify the, uh, the abundance of, uh, of MAC in different mask conditions, uh, we see indeed that if you knock down local expression of complement factor H, there's more MAC injury or more MAC insertion on the endothelial cells. Now, you know, the, the serum that we're adding has its own circulating factor H also, but this argues for the importance of local synthesis and local control. Well, in patients, we don't want to knock down expression, we want to increase it. And so uh, Kelly also did some experiments to uh, to uh, interrogate the question of can we increase factor H locally in endothelial cells and does that uh, do anything to them? And so um, the, the cells I'm gonna be telling you about are actually stem cell derived choroidal endothelial cells from a patient uh, who had, who was both uh, homozygous for, for high risk factor H genotype, Y402H, 
but also had on one allele a stop codon, premature stop codon, and had early onset AMD. So uh, this is an, an eye that had very high susceptibility to, uh, to complement. So with the CFH lentivirus in these cells, Kelly was able to increase expression uh, uh, very highly. And in this case, when we expose the cells to complement, unlike those control cells I showed you in a minute, they have a lot of MAC uh, inserted on their membrane. They're relatively vulnerable normally to, uh, to complement. However, in cells that receive the CFH linti, uh, they're much more robustly protected against uh, complement insertion. And we can also um, uh, quantify this. And uh, these results were published uh, uh, this year in Journal of Pathology. So, you know, all, all these experiments I've, I've been talking to you about uh, for the last few minutes are ways that we might be able to buttress existing endothelial cells from further injury. Um, but if the endothelial cells are already degenerated, as Miracle Max, uh, you know, points out, there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Um, then some other method, you, you can't re-drug them into, uh, into health, you can't re-gene uh, express them uh, back to life. Uh, instead, there needs to be some approach to restoring the ones that are, that are lost. And so, uh, you know, in a case like this, where uh, there's an eye with confluent basal laminar deposit, there's extensive ghost vessels, um, you know, is there a, an approach to replace those cells? And so, um, you know, very fortunately, uh, for me, uh, we, we recruited Bud Tucker uh, over a decade ago now to our uh, to our institute, and um, it's a fantastic stem cell scientist. He understands all of these uh, all of these phenomena uh, of how to create different kinds of cells from uh, from iPSCs. And um, you know, there's some considerations anytime that you think about uh, stem cell replacement therapy. And you know, would you want to use a, a master bank of cells that was was uh, kind of one one cell fits all for everybody, or does it need to be allogenic from the same uh, or autologous from the same person? Um, you know, there's been an argument in the field for years that the neural retina and the RPE are immune privileged, and that it, it, you don't need to do any immune matching. And I don't think that that's really true. But for the purpose of this talk, for the core, there's no way uh, that that's the case. Um, you know, in fact, Curia capillaris expresses the highest levels of MHC plus one antigens, uh, like in the eye. And so uh, it's, it's, it's advertising the self-identity constantly to the immune system. So any sort of replacement therapy would really, I think, need to be, uh, to be an autologous approach. And so, uh, so, so Bud and uh, Kelly have worked out this uh, protocol for generating from iPSCs choroidal type endothelial cells. And um, if, if anybody asks me details about this protocol, I'm gonna do my Zoom freeze uh, and, uh, and refer them to my uh, colleagues for that. Um, but uh, there's, it's, a, it's a protocol that involves multiple steps, changes in growth factors, and uh, ultimately the generation of these cells that express uh, choroid restricted endothelial cell markers. And uh, here's an example of what the cells look like. They form a cobblestone pattern. They express uh, CD31. They form tubes in uh, matrix gel. And ultrastructurally, comparing uh, a, a capillary from a young eye to, a, uh, to the capillaries that form from these endothelial cells, they're really quite similar. And I think it's, it's uh, sort of hard to tell uh, Who's who? In, the, in this case, the young the young eye is on the left, and the uh, stem cell derived endothelial cell is on the right. So, we've started using uh, these and other cells as uh, a, a way to uh, explore first in vitro: can we regrow blood vessels into uh, ghosts? And so, uh, so Katie Cherko worked on a method for decellularizing the choroid. We're able to uh, extract all the cells but leave all of the extracellular matrix as a uh, sort of first, uh, you know, first proof of principle to recellularize the choroid. And you can see a cell uh, occupying one of these ghost vessels here. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we, we want to put these into animals that have had a, their choroid damaged by immunotoxin or laser uh, or, uh, or genotype. 
And so this is just a, an example of um, our experiments to put GFP labeled uh, endothelial cells into the choroid uh, of a rat. And, um, and, and this is what this looks like. So these are all uh, in progress research programs derived at, you know, can we, can we rescue the chorea capillaris when it's, when it's damaged but still there? And can we replace it uh, once it's fully degenerated? So, you know, there are a lot of questions uh, remaining for this work, and uh, you all will come up with better ones than me. Um, but, you know, the fact that we see complement activation at some normal level, uh, almost from birth, may suggest that there's some beneficial role. Uh, you know, the, the RPE is constantly phagocytosing outer segments. Uh, you know, so if, if one RPE cell has 30 photoreceptors that it's responsible for, and it removes 10 uh, percent of the outer segments every day, then, then it's the three entire uh, outer segments a day are being completely reduced to atoms uh, by the RPE. And, you know, this is an amazing process. It's very efficient. RPE gets some benefits out of it as well as we're learning. Um, but any anything less than 100% efficiency for that process means there's going to be uh, excess material that needs to be removed somehow. Maybe the MAC uh, helps in that removal. Um, you know, another question, what is it about this interface that's so stimulating to complement activation? Uh, and is that something that we can decipher biochemically? And is that something that we can address pharmacologically uh, to, to lighten up the MAC injury that happens in, uh, in choroid. You know, another thing that's, that's, that's kind of strange is it's not every cell, even in a culture dish, when cells are exposed to complement, it's not every cell that accumulates MAC. It's, a, it's some of the cells. And so even within a, a population as homogeneous as cultured endothelial cells, there are differences that determine why one cell gets mac and another doesn't. And determining what those differences are is going to be important in, uh, in defining this process further. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, these are, these are questions. You all have better ones. Um, and uh, so in summary, we see choreocapillaris loss of the vasculature. It happens early in AMD, and it happens more in advanced AMD. The, the membrane attack complex and complement becomes activated on choroidal endothelial cell surfaces. And this activation is increased during aging. It's increased in eyes with AMD, and it's increased in eyes with high-risk genotypes. And um, strategies to both protect the existing choreocapillaris endothelial cells that are under duress, but not yet dead, uh, as well as to replace the ones that have been uh, destroyed uh, are areas that need to be explored in, um, in AMD. And so uh, with that, uh, I'd just like to uh, give a few thanks. So, um, you know, all the work I've talked to you about today has been uh, research that's derived from uh, patient donations, from uh, donors and their families who've decided that uh, they want to make a positive difference in the world by an anatomical gift for research. And so uh, we're extremely grateful to them. And uh, our partnership with the Iowa Lions Eye Bank, who uh, is our partner in the, the sort of physical procurement around the clock for these uh, donations. My IVR collaborators, especially uh, Bud Tucker and Ed Stone, and um, our funding sources, uh, and then uh, mostly the people in the lab who do all the work, and, uh, and I kind of get all the credit. And um, so uh, I want to acknowledge and thank them. And uh, with that, uh, I would be delighted to uh, try to take any questions. Thank you. There is another question on the web. So maybe we we'll start with Wei Shang. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for this uh, great talk. Uh, my question is the the ghost cell that you observe for the choroid uh, capillary in the geographic atrophy. Are those ghost cells similar to the ghost cell in the diabetes retinopathy? Like, for example, loss of uh, parasite, something like that. Thank you. Yes, right. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I, I, there are similarities and differences. Um, the, uh, 
there, there are definitely pericytes in the Cordy capillaris, but they're nothing like as numerous or integrated uh, as as we see in retina. And so, you know, the, the um, it, there, there's a group in um, uh, uh, Cheyenne Roy at, at uh, BU has been interested in uh, pericyte changes in, in aging that uh, may proceed in thelial cell uh, changes. So, um, you know, there, there, there's evidence for that, uh, but, but it's, it's a little different in terms of, you know, you think about a retinal capillary as the endothelial cell and then wrapped 360 degrees around that is pericyte and then wrapped 360 degrees around that is um, uh, astrocyte processes or Mueller cell processes. And, um, you know, the, and, and these are things that help create the blood retinal barrier. And uh, in, in choroid, it's, it's much more uh, open and leaky. Uh, and so there are, there are pericytes, but they're not providing a barrier effect uh, as we see. And, and not every endothelial cell uh, has a pericyte associated with it in choroid. All right, let's move on to uh, Scott. Hey Rob, Scott McLeod here. How you doing? Hey Scott, great. Great job, great job. Uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, you know, you, we we all shown that CC dropout occurs early in AMD, but have you ever given any thought as to why the macula in particular is particularly vulnerable to changes? Uh, we know that macular choroid has the highest density of feeding arterioles. And generally, the branches occur at right angles to supply the choroid capillaries. Have you tried to quantify the number of arterial connections to the CC in your studies? Jerry, all, Jerry and I always felt that there were fewer feeding arterials, but we never got around to quantifying them. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Scott, for that question. And, and um, I, I, want, I want to, um, uh, for, for anybody who's, who's, who's on the call who doesn't know, Scott, uh, McLeod is, uh, was Jerry Luddy's right-hand man for all of these incredible studies. And it's, uh, you know, I'm really uh, delighted that you're um, able to join Scott. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we did some quantification of, um, of large vessel densities. Um, and, and it's a little bit tricky because, you know, with, with our, with the way you guys do the, um, the hole mounts, um, this is probably a better way. And you know, I remember Jerry telling me, you know, whole mouths are the way to go uh, for these kinds of studies. But the histological approaches we've taken, if you sort of compare, you know, we, we want to look at Cori capillaris and skip 20 sections and look again and skip 20 sections and look again. There's, there's very similar uh, profiles. You know, the, the numbers are very similar. Large vessels, not so, because they, they come and go and everything. Uh, so, so, yeah, I agree. I think that looking at the... Uh, the, the large vascular supply in addition to the chorea capillaris is really important. Um, you know, we do think that because the, the complement connection where the, the region where there's injury happens kind of from the, the inside out, you know, so from, from, from small vessels uh, toward large vessels instead of the other way around is where we put most of our focus. But I, I have no doubt that uh, the work that you and Jerry did on, uh, you know, atherosclerosis and, and fibrosis of these large vessels is also uh, really important. So thanks for the question. All right, we have at least 10 more questions. So let's just move on. Keith. All right, Keith is sleeping. So how about Barb? Maybe he was muted. Barb is not muted. Yay. Rob, <laughs> awesome talk. Um, I am puzzled by numbers. So as you pointed out, your serum contains a large amount of CFH, right? So you're using what, 25% serum mm -hmm. to stimulate your cells, which should be about, I don't know, 100, 200 nanograms, or sorry, micrograms per ml of serum, of, of CFH in that serum, and your cells secrete 50 nanograms per ml. What's the difference? Why, why does locally secreted FH protect? Whereas FH in serum does not. What's the difference? Yeah, I mean, it, it may be something as, as uh, straightforward as, as loading of the glycocalyx, you know, that, that it's easy to, to, to bind a bunch of CFH to the glycocalyx of the endothelium if, if, it's, if it's being produced locally compared to if it's uh, extraneous. But um, yeah, that's a great question. And, and for our, um, for our secretion stuff, I mean, it was it was based on a, a certain volume of, of filter medium and everything like that. So that's not really normalizable, I don't think, to uh, to the real world in that way. Okay. Uh, 
let's take a few questions from the room, uh, John and Zach. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mullins, for that fantastic talk. It was wonderful. Um, I was wondering uh, if you've ever thought of this process under the context of, like, so let's say an infection, like bacterial infection or uveitis, um, especially in those with this uh, the CFH uh, deficiency, um, would that precipitate this sort of damage by the MAC, MAC generation by stimulation of the complement path? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And we, we get a few samples from, um, you know, multi uh, multifocal choroiditis eyes or uh, uh, birdshot choroiretinopathy. And so um, we, we have samples that could be studied that way. It's not something that we've um, uh, done to this point. And, you know, the, the relative importance of complement versus the adaptive immune system for those, uh, those conditions, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's lots to be done there. All right, uh, Zach. Hi, Dr. Mullins. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. Um, so mine was kind of related to analogous tissues, the chorio chorio capillaris. Um, I'm trying to think about the blood-brain barrier and whether there are, there's an analog to the chorio capillaris in the eye in the brain blood-brain barrier. Um, if so, is there a presence of the MAC complex um, or like MAC in that tissue as well? Like that forward. Yeah, so great question. I, you know, I, the, the closest I could comment is the blood retinal barrier because that's that's a you know uh, it, it's it's certainly similarly constructed as blood brain barrier, and um, you know, and, and there are some some real differences, including things like gene expression in the endothelial cells between the retina and the and the choroid, um, and so things like uh, 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 Claudin five, <laughs> you know, highly expressed in retinal. Kepler endothelial cells, lowly expressed in choroidal uh, endothelial cells. And then, uh, you know, as we talked about a minute ago, this whole difference in the pericyte uh, abundance and, and structure and everything. So, um, so yeah, I'm unaware of, of uh, MAC and blood-brain barrier, but we don't see it in the, in the retinal capillaries. All right, let's move to two more questions from the room and we go back to Zoom. Sam and Caroline. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Mullins. Thank you for your talk. I have two... Uh, interrelated questions. Uh, one is, uh, what is known about protective CFH variants? Like, are there ones that absolutely decrease the risk of uh, disease compared to like the general population? And if so, would it be feasible to overexpress them in the liver to kind of overcome this less, uh, less efficient uh, systemic circulation? Uh, yes, so great, great question. Um, yeah, I think that the, the uh, there are with, within factory itself other uh, more protective variants, and then the, the big area that people are interested in is in these uh, factor H related genes, which a deletion uh, of of those genes is protective against AMD. So I think one could imagine a situation of knocking out uh, those genes in the liver. Those aren't expressed in the eye, though, and so for our uh, you know both sort of biological interest and and, and focus and everything. Uh, but also where we imagine translationally being involved, um, changing those genes in the eye would not be helpful. Hi, Dr. Mullins. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering about the recellularization uh, experiments. Were you able to observe like any phenotypic you know, rescue of like the Drusen deposits? Like after you've done like the the ghost vessels have been like occupied by new vessels? Have you been able to, due to the leaky uh, uh, properties of the CC, were you able to like observe any ameliorate in the sense? Right, thank you. Yeah, we, we have not yet uh, gotten those experiments that far. You know, probably we'd have to regrow RPE on top of the decellularized Brooks membrane for there to be a, a source of drusenoid material to, uh, you know, to, to quantify its change or anything like that. Um, but you know, the, the, all of these great experiments where people grow RPE cells and the RPE makes sort of drusenoid deposits, uh, so far have been happening under like zero flow, um, you know, underneath the, the artificial Burt's membrane. And so it may be that the slurping fluid through, the, uh, through those would really be informative about what the role of choreocapillaris is in uh, removing debris. Okay, let's go to Matthew and Eric afterwards. <clears throat> 
there's a localization that has to be. And so there are uh, other components. We can't hear you. Can I, I, am I double muted? All you're right. fading. You're fading in and out. So let's move to Eric. Just not loud enough. Now it's okay. Right. So about local activation, you need C three and C five to um, get MAC deposition. There's plenty of C five produced locally, but it's really difficult to find evidence of it. significant amounts of, uh, of of C five locally. Sorry, I said C three earlier. So is it thought that the the necessary amounts of C5 for magnet deposition is come from systemic circulation? Or do you think that um, in these disease tissues you do you get operation of C5? Ralph, why don't you repeat this question? We were it was fading out. Yeah, I think I, I think I understood the uh, the, the gist of uh, the question is uh, you know there, there's both systemic sources of some of these components and there's local sources and um, and, and the, the question is specifically about C5. Um, yeah, so even for the, so for, for all of these, um, you, you know, even for, for C1Q through C9, for example, um, there are, so, some are highly synthesized locally and some are not. And so, uh, you know, for the MAC, we don't see local C8 or uh, C7, uh, but we see, uh, you know, other, uh, or, or sorry, C9. Um, so there's some, you know, even if a lot of the MAC components are being produced locally, it needs to be a cooperative process with some of these um, proteins, like C9, for example, delivered from the circulation. Okay. I have a question. I'm sorry. I can, I'm, I'm sorry. And, and, and this is Napoleon Ferrari. There's some difficulty in my browser and allow you me to raise my hands. Uh, this was a great talk, you know, absolutely. I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, Biggie, you've been given you a very elegant single cell transcriptomic data set. If you compare, let's say, choroidal endothelial cells with other fenestrate endothelial, let's say, choroid plexus, uh, median eminence, liver, etc., for expression of uh, CF, CFH, because this is kind of puzzling that only the, the choreo capillary is so dramatically affected. The second question is, have you tested with any, any factor, any growth factor can protect you know, endothelial cells, at least? in vitro from the, the MAC, you know? Yeah, thanks. So the uh, comparing, um, somebody could do that. Our, our guys could do this for sure, about taking all of our uh, single cell choroid data and, and compiling it with other organs and, and, uh, and looking for similarities and differences. Uh, we, haven't, um, we haven't done that, uh, but, but that's, that's an excellent, excellent point. And, and your second question? If, if you test if any growth factor like if Jeff, you know, basic if Jeff, you name it, it can protect, you know, at least, you know, cultural choro choroidal endothelial cells from your exposing to your MAC, you know, to, to, to your actual, yeah. Yeah, great, great question. We, uh, there, there is, there is VEGF in our culture media that we grow the endothelial cells in, but um, we, we haven't tinkered with the concentrations of that or anything like that to see if there's a, a benefit. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Napa, we always welcome you. Thank Eddie. you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> nice to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Mullins. This is Eric Nguyen. Um, that was an excellent talk. Uh, so you basically show a lot of MAC accumulation in your cross-sectional um, images of the eye and how specific to the choroid rather than, say, the kidney or uh, other tissues. Does the level of MAC stay consistent as you go from the macula to the periphery, or is it, um, or does it drop off? And my second question is, uh, have you seen MAC activation uh, on choroidal pericytes and fibroblasts in addition to endothelial cells? Thank you. Great, thanks. So, the, uh, I'll, I'll, so the, for the second question, um, you know, any cell, that, a lot of that activation is on the extracellular matrix, you know? And, and so, um, so any cell that was inhabiting that space could be, uh, could be injur injured through uh, you know, uh, the, the presence of the complex. Uh, but we don't. But where most of the macrophages and fibroblasts are deeper down, we don't see we don't see any mac. So it's it's really you know concentrated at that interface. Okay. Um, and then the, the macular peripheral question. Um, you know we, there there are there's this gene RGCC uh, or RGC32, which is a, a gene that's that's increased in expression after mac injury, and that was highly enriched in macular endothelial cells uh, compared to peripheral ones. Um, huh, okay. we, we do see some, you know, there, there, it's it's not like it's just restricted to the to the uh, you know central thirty degrees or something. Even I mean, it's it, it the, the the MAC does go out uh, to the periphery, but it, it, it attenuates. But then so does the whole choroid get thinner. You know. So. Mm. 
Okay, thank you. All right, so we have last four questions from uh, from the uh, web and uh, two more from the room. And then we have a fantastic summary by Goldis. Uh, so she will be my victim. So Kathy, you can rest. Uh, don't worry about it. Irene. Thank you, Dr. Mullins, for your great talk. Uh, my question is more a technical question. Um, what cell culture media do you use to specifically activate MAC in your endothelial cell in vitro culture? Yeah, so we've done this a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think for, for our various papers, you know, sometimes we use uh, serum pre, sometimes we, uh, you know, just stimulate the human serum. Um, sometimes we used, um, have used barb. We haven't published this stuff yet, but we've used Barb's approach of, of sort of preconditioning the cells with uh, hydrogen peroxide to make them more uh, susceptible. Um, but the the main uh, endothelial cell culture that we're using right now, I think, is the RND uh, supplemented uh, endothelial cell media. Thank you. Hey, Roxana. Good morning. Hi. Hi, thank you. Rob, excellent presentation, fantastic uh, data too. So you emphasize about the role of expression of this locally expression of complement factor age. Is there any difference between the central versus uh, peripheral expression in this protein? That's the first question. And second one, um, also related to the local uh, complement uh, you know, reactivity, uh, do the choroid capillary uh, cell express other negative regulatory complement protein that are very important, you know, in this dynamic formation of MAC? Yeah. So the the uh, so thanks very much, Roxana. And everybody uh, knows that Roxana is doing this fabulous work on RPE cells in ABCA4 disease and the um, and, and the role of complement in the injury of those cells. Um, so regionally. Um, yeah, we we uh, the the, the complement genes that there was a there was a decreased expression of factor H in the macular comparative peripheral uh, corticopterus, um, and but it was there if you looked for it. It wasn't necessarily one of the the, the largest signals or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean you know going through it, it, anybody can use these um, data from HTTPS <laughs> colon uh, single cell dash i dot org. Um, and, and can ask these questions. Um, and uh, the, um, because, you know, the, a lot of these things, part of the reason why we wanted to create this website and anybody can use, is there are questions like this that, um, that, that you know better than we do to, to ask, you know? Um, so, uh, so anyway, there are, there are some uh, macular peripheral differences, uh, whether or not, you know, um, all of those are highly significant or not. Um, I, I'm not sure off there. Thank you. Jao Gu. Hi, I have, uh, that's a great talk. I have two questions. First is, um, have you or anyone examined um, mast cells in the core? Do they play any role in the MAC formation or the CC dropout? Um, the other question I have is, um, is it possible to stratify the CC density and the juicin size with APOE genotypes in the human samples? Thank you. Great. Yeah. So mast cells, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Luddy and Scott and um, uh, and Imran and, and colleagues were um, have done a lot of great work on that. And uh, yeah, in fact, there are more mast cells in Isaac Sugar after atrophy, and they uh, they're they're more uh, you know what's the word where they discharge their contents. So that's that's observed more. Uh, and then there's another paper recently where the uh, the uh, a group from uh, UK used the UK Biobank and identified as a function of high risk genotypes more mast cell proteins uh, present using pro shotgun proteomics. The interface of that exactly to uh, our MAC story um, is a connection we've made uh, up to this point, but it's certainly you know uh, possible and likely. And then, uh, yeah, APOE versus Drusen, uh, that's, um, yeah, that's highly doable. We, we used to think you, you had to do sort of like a, a, a PCR and, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, restriction enzyme map, but, uh, you know, we, we can define most of the um, APOE genotypes we're interested in just with, um, with, with TACMAN assays too, so. Uh, so. So, yes, it's highly doable. 
All right, Jing Yu, are you there or? Yes, it's in. Uh, so my question is, that's great uh, talk. I have a question is about uh, the CFH knockout mice. Do you have any idea about your CC in, in that condition? And the second question is, um, uh, in your mind, if we directly knock down CFH in retina and chloride, can we generate like uh, such a level of AMD model in NHP or mice? Right. So, um... So great questions. The, uh, the, the factory H knockout mouse, uh, although we've got some eyes from some in my lab right now, uh, we haven't looked at them yet, but, uh, and, and I know other people have been uh, active in that field and uh, I'm remiss that I, I'm not uh, more on top of that. Um, yeah, I mean, generally the idea of, of we, my whole career, it's been true that uh, people have said there aren't good MAC antibodies that, that work on mouse. And then um, I think that's increasingly uh, less true than it used to be. But um, you know, aging mouse, we don't see all of the same uh, events vis-a-vis complement as we do in, in, in even normal uh, aging human. Uh, so, um, but I, I think that's a you know a, that'd be a valid approach. And it may be that you know that there are things that are that are a little bit different in mouse. So, um, for example, mouse macrophages express high levels of factor H. Human macrophages, at least in the choroid, did not, and so the, the uh, you know the way that these inhibitors are uh, are, are expressed differs a little bit uh, in different species. But I, I still think that would be a, a really uh, that that would be a, an approach that I'd be enthusiastic about. So if we, for example, I'm sorry to bother. So if we long term to use a you know this uh, SNRA to knock down the the local. Uh, CFH expression. Do you think that's what affected your CC in the in the in the capillary around the cori? Uh, yeah, I think that that's uh, I think that's a real possibility. Yes. All okay. right. We all anticipating here for summary by Goldis, but two more questions: Dorota and then Emma. Hi Rob. Um, uh, it's fantastic talk, really, um, and I got very interested in something else than. I saw, I hear the questions actually in age and AMD related uh, CC dropout, paracapillary dropout, and, um, and accumulation of the MAC, which may suggest that there is uh, some chronic stress or response, stress response to several different instances of stress to life. And accumulation of fibrotic tissue then suggests that there might be a senescence mechanism as one uh, that is a step, one of the steps of the. Uh, this this CC dropout uh, mechanism. Have you thought about it? And we have, have you noted uh, anything like that? Yeah, thanks very much. We, we um, so we're, we're very late to the senescence uh, party compared to uh, to you and uh, uh, other other folks who've been doing great work, work in this area, uh, Dorota. And um, the uh, but but in, in terms of endothelial cells specifically. And whether they undergo uh, some program that um, that makes them more susceptible, because yeah, I mean, there's we, we see this MAC injury over the course of a lifetime, but we only see loss in you know more advanced uh, disease. And so, why is it that uh, at 40 years old I was able to shrug off this complement injury, and was it that neighboring cells were able to grow in and just replace the one that was lost, and that this is related to um, senescence or something like that? I think that's a really um, uh, I, I think that's an exciting possibility to explore. Um, the, the few experiments we've done, it's not like a slam dunk, you know? So if we uh, use some markers of senescence on aging choroid, it's not like, um, it's like, oh, of course, you know, these are all, these are all blue with, uh, with X-Gal or something, um, uh, or with some of the other nuclear markers. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely an exciting area. And uh, we, we have a little bit of work presented about that at ARPA this year. Emma. Hi, Dr. Mullins. Um, I'm Emma. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Tim Kern's lab. So I work extensively on the uh, retinal vasculature. So my question is, um, is regarding the MAC local expression, uh, have you seen any correlation between the visual cycle and the expression of MAC1? So, so I didn't quite catch the, the question. Is it visual cycle and have you seen any correlation of the visual cycle with the expression of MAC? Have you 
block the visual cycle at any point to see if that right. increases, decreases expression of MAC, the local expression. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great thought. You know, we, we could, uh, you know, certainly, or, or, or somebody with RP65 knockout mice or LRAD or, or something where um, uh, interfering with, with those, um, with, with that process and, and seeing, yeah, it's not something we've done at all, but I, I like that idea. Right, and now, all this, all yours. Thank you, Rob, that was excellent. I have to say, every time I listen to your talks, it really helps pull out those of us who are RP-centric out of our worlds and really appreciate that there's, we got to look at the vasculature, the outer vasculature and the choroid in more detail. So thank you for that. I have a question because it's really striking to me that you have still these cells in what are ghost vessels. Have you had a chance to look at the composition? Could they be immune cells? If they are immune cells, would you predict they're doing good things, trying to trying to preserve or slow down the loss of you know the functionality of that vessel, or do you think they're going in there and just basically trying to get rid of it? Yeah. Well, thanks so much. It's a great question. Um, some of those cells will react with antibodies directly against CD forty five. So uh, you know all all classes of white blood cells, and, and whether they're the the mast cells that um, you know that Jerry uh, described or um, or macrophages, but you know they, they don't look like neutrophils. I would say from the DAPI, it doesn't you know you don't see little lobed uh, nuclei or something like that, and more like bean shaped around nuclei. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the you know eventually those ghost vessels will fill in with with. Uh, with collagen and you won't you won't sort of see the little spikes where the intercapillary pillars used to be um but i think that happens like in you know very long-standing panorental photocoagulation uh, that a kind of thing and uh so but yeah the the uh you know i think the main thing that those cells have done in the community is tricked people into thinking that that was an intact capillary he was like well look there's a there's a cell going through it it's like eh, it's not going through it it's it's just kind of hanging out there and I'm sorry, um, Rob, I'm getting this telepathic message from Kathy. I have a feeling she has a question. So I'm just going to toss it to her really quickly. But thank you again for your I agree. Time. I had the same thing uh, <laughs> happen to me maybe this week or if not this week, next week. I, my, <laughs> I really, I, fabulous talk as always. And I really, I agree with Golis about pulling us out of the RP. Difficult, but getting us there. I had a quick question about how you've incorporated the effect of the pro protective alleles and what you've been looking at, and how you see in in AMD uh, cross sections where you know they have both the risk allele in CFH and the protective allele, and that that changes the staining you're seeing. Right. You know, it's um. So there's this sort of uh, compounding of number of samples one would need. To, to do an experiment with any sort of power. Uh, and I remember I was, I, was, uh, I, I mentioned this, you know, like, like we were, we're sort of looking at a, uh, you know, the specific uh, allele at a time. And, and, and you're exactly right. I mean, all of these uh, genes exist on haplotype blocks that, you know, all, all the polymorphisms do. And so for every person with y 4 h they also have either a, a, a valine or an isoleucine It's the position 62. And, um, and they, they do or don't have the deletion of the, um, you, you know, the CFHR locus. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a little bit like with other, like smoking or, or other things like, okay, we could try to power a study based on that, but we're going to look at this, uh, at this one thing. And, uh, you know, so, so there's no doubt that we have more noise, uh, you know, in the uh, genetic signal, um, than we could. But we'd also need like for, for every you know other um, variant that we look at, we need twice as many samples to do the same experiment, you know. So uh, that's kind of where we are with these. Well, it was in it's interesting because Greg shows pictures of C3 deposition in patients that are either a pure protective or a pure risk for CFH. And one has the C3, which is the risk, and the other one doesn't. And it's incredibly striking. So I was just wondering if you've ever seen incidences of, the, of that in the choroid. Right. I mean, most, 99% uh, of uh, samples we look at have have, uh, have MAC in the choroid capillaries to some degree. And with our, you know, with my fluorescent uh, <laughs> quantitative eye, 
I can't tell them apart, but that's, you know, but the Eliza can. Um, so. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Rob, and thank you, everybody. I will see you two weeks from now. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>